Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew and today I'm going to be reading two stories for you. I'm going to be reading The Magic Shop by H.G. Wells and Appointment by Olivia Parks. If you enjoyed today's readings and would like to uh, watch the next program, Word of Mouth is broadcast on the first and third Thursdays of every month at 12.10 p.m. Central Time. You can watch it live through the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library's Facebook page, or you can watch it later that day on the Montgomery City County Public Library's YouTube page. That's all the announcements I have today. Let's begin with our first story, The Magic Shop by H.G. Wells. I had seen the magic shop from afar several times. I had passed it once or twice, a shop window of alluring little objects, magic balls, magic hens, wonderful cones, ventriloquist dolls, the materials of the basket trick, packs of cards that looked all right, and all that sort of thing. But never had I thought of going in until one day, almost without warning, Gip hauled me by my finger right up to the window, and so conducted himself that there was nothing for it but to take him in. I had not thought the place was there to tell the truth. A modest-sized frontage on Regent Street, between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about just out of patent incubators. But there it was, sure enough. I had fancied it was down nearer the circus, or round the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn. Always over the way and a little inaccessible it had been, with something of the mirage in its position. But here it was now quite indisputably and the fat end of Gip's pointing finger made a noise upon the glass. "'If I was rich,' said Gip, dabbing a finger at the disappearing egg, "'I'd buy myself that, and that, which was the crying baby, very human, "'and that, which was a mystery, and so-called a neat card asserted, "'buy one and astonish your friends.' "'Anything,' said Gip, "'would disappear under one of those cones I have read about it in a book. "'And there, Dada, is the vanishing halfpenny, only... They've put it this way up so we can't see how it's done. Gip, dear boy, inherits his mother's breeding, and he did not propose to enter the shop or worry in any way. Only, you know, quite unconsciously, he tugged my finger doorward, and he made his interest clear. That, he said, pointing to the magic bottle. Have you had that? I said, at which promising inquiry he looked up with a sudden radiance. I could show it to Jesse, he said, thoughtful as ever of others. It's less than a hundred days to your birthday, Gibbles, I said, and laid my hand to the door handle. Gip made no answer, but his grip tightened on my finger, and so we came into the shop. It was no common shop, this. It was a magic shop, and all the prancing precedence Gip would have taken in the matter of mere toys was wanting. He left the burden of the conversation to me. It was a little narrow shop, not very well lit, and the doorbell pinged again with a plaintive note as we closed it behind us. For a moment or so, we were alone and could glance around us. There was a tiger in paper mache on the glass case that covered the low counter, a grave, kind-eyed tiger that waggled his head in a methodical manner. There were several crystal spheres, a china hand holding magic cards, a stock of magic fish bowls in varying sizes, and an immodest magic hat that shamelessly displayed its springs. On the floor were magic mirrors, one to draw you out long and thin, one to swell your head and vanish your legs, and one to make you short and fat like a draught. And while we were laughing at these, the shopman, as I suppose, came in. At any rate, there he was behind the counter, a curious, sallow, dark man with one ear larger than the other and a chin like the toe cap of a boot. What can we have the pleasure, he said, spreading his long magic fingers on the glass case. And so, with a start, we were aware of him. I want, I said, to buy my little boy a few simple tricks. A ledger domain, he said. Mechanical, domestic, anything amusing, said I. Ah, said the shopman, and scratched his head for a moment as if thinking. Then, quite distinctly, he drew from his head a glass ball. Something in this way, he said, and held it out. The action was unexpected. I had seen the trick done at entertainments interless times before. It's a common part of the common stock of conjurers. But I had not expected it here. <laughs> That's good, I said with a laugh. Isn't it? 
said the shopman. Gip stretched out his disengaged hand to take this object and found merely a blank palm. It's in your pocket, said the shopman, and there it was. How much will that be? I asked. <laughs> we take no charge for glass balls, said the shopman politely. We get them. He picked one out of his elbow as he spoke. Free. He produced another from the back of his neck and laid it beside its predecessor on the counter. Gip regarded his glass ball sagely, then directed a look of inquiry at the two on the counter, and finally brought his round-eyed scrutiny to the shopman, who smiled. You may have those two, said the shopman, and, if you don't mind, one from my mouth. So. Gip counseled me mutely for a moment, and then in a profound silence put away the four balls, resumed my reassuring finger, and nerved himself for the next event. We get all our smaller tricks that way, the shopman remarked. I laughed in the manner of one who subscribes to a jest. <laughs> Instead of going to a wholesale shop, I said, of course it's cheaper. In a way, the shopman said, though we pay in the end, but not so heavily as people suppose. Our larger tricks and our daily provisions and all the other things we want, we get out of that hat. And you know, sir, if you'll excuse my saying it, there isn't a wholesale magic shop. Not for genuine magic goods, sir. I don't know if you noticed our inscription, the genuine magic shop. He drew a business card from his cheek and handed it to me. Genuine, he said, with his finger on the word and added, there is absolutely no deception, sir. He seemed to be carrying out the joke pretty thoroughly, I thought. He returned to Gip with a smile of remarkable affability. You, you know, are the right sort of boy. I was rather surprised at his knowing that, because in the interest of discipline, we kept it rather a secret, even at home, but Gip received it in an unflinching silence, keeping a steadfast eye on him. It's only the right sort of boy gets through that doorway. As if by way of illustration, there came a rattling at the door, and a squeaking little voice could be faintly heard. Yeah, I won't go in there, Dada. I won't go in there. <laughs> and then the accents of a downtrodden parent, urging consolations and propitiations. It's locked, Edward, he said. But it isn't, said I. It is, sir, said the shopman, always for that sort of child. And as he spoke, we had a glimpse of the other youngster, a white little face, pallid from sweet eating and over food, and distorted by evil passions, a ruthless little egotist, pawing at the enchanted pane. It's no good, sir, said the shopman, as I moved with my natural helpfulness toward the door and presently the spoilt child was carried off howling. How do you manage that? I said, breathing a little more freely. <laughs> Magic, said the shopman with a careless wave of the hand, and behold, sparks of colored fire flew out of his fingertips and vanished into the shadows of the shop. You were saying, he said, addressing himself to Gip, before you came in that you would like one of our buy one and astonish your friend's boxes. Gip, after a gallant effort, said, Yes, it's in your pocket. And leaning over the counter, he really had an extraordinarily long body. This amazing person produced the article in the customary conjurer's manner. Paper, he said, and took a sheet out of the empty hat with the springs. String, and behold his mouth was a string box from which he drew an unending thread, which when he had tied his parcel, he bit off and it seemed to me swallowed the ball of string. Then he lit a candle at the nose of one of the ventriloquist dummies, stuck one of his fingers, which had become red sealing wax, into the flame, and so sealed the parcel. Then there was the disappearing egg, he remarked, and produced one from within my coat pocket and packed it, and also the crying baby, very human. I handed each parcel to Gip as it was ready, and he clasped them to his chest. He said very little, but his eyes were eloquent. The clutch of his arms was eloquent. He was the playground of unspeakable emotions. These, you know, were real magics. Then with a start, I discovered something moving about in my hat, something soft and jumpy. I whipped it off and a ruffled pigeon, no doubt a confederate, dropped out and ran on the counter and went, I fancy, into a cardboard box 
behind the paper mache tiger. Tut, tut, said the shopman, dexterously relieving me of my headdress. Careless bird, and as I live, nesting. He shook my hat, and out of his, into his extended hand, two or three eggs, a large marble, a watch, about half a dozen of the inevitable glass balls, and then crumpled, crinkled paper more and more and more, taking all the time of the way in which people neglect to brush their hats inside as well as out. Politely, of course, but with a certain personal application. All sorts of things accumulate, sir. Not you, of course, in particular. Uh, nearly every customer. Oh, astonishing what they carry about with them. The crumpled paper rose and billowed on the counter more and more and more until he was nearly hidden from us, until he was altogether hidden, and still his voice went on and on. We none of us know what the fair semblance of a human being may conceal, sir. Are we all then no better than brushed exteriors, whited sepulchres? His voice stopped, exactly like when you hit a neighbor's gramophone with a well-aimed brick. The same instant silence, and the rustle of the paper stopped, and everything was still. Have you done with my hat? I said after an interval. There was no answer. I stared at Gip, and Gip stared at me. And there were our distortions in the magic mirrors, looking very rum and grave and quiet. I think we'll go now. I said, will you tell me how much this all comes to? I say, I said on a rather louder note, I want the bill and my hat, please. It might have been a sniff from behind the paper pile. Let's look behind the counter, Gip, I said. He's making fun of us. I led Gip round the head wagging tiger, and what do you think there was on behind the counter? No one at all. Only my hat on the floor and a common conjurer's lop-eared white rabbit, lost in meditation, and looking as stupid and crumpled as only a conjurer's rabbit can do. I resumed my hat, and the rabbit lolloped a lollop or so out of my way. Dada, said Gip in a guilty whisper. What is it, Gip? said I. I do like this shop, Dada. So should I, I said to myself, if the counter wouldn't suddenly extend itself to shut one off from the door. But I didn't call Gibbs attention to that. Ah, pussy, he said, with a hand out to the rabbit as it came lolloping past us. Pussy, do get a magic. And his eyes followed it as it squeezed through a door I had certainly not remarked a moment before. Then the door opened wider, and the man with one ear larger than the other appeared again. He was smiling still, but his eye met mine with something between amusement and defiance. You'd like to see our showroom, sir he said with an innocent suavity. Gip tugged my finger forward. I glanced at the counter and met the shopman's eye again. I was beginning to think the magic was just a little too genuine. We haven't very much time, I said. But somehow we were inside the showroom before I could finish that. All goods of the same quality, said the shopman, rubbing his flexible hands together. And that is the best. Nothing in the place that isn't genuine magic and warranted thoroughly rum. Excuse me, sir. I felt him pull at something that clung to my coat sleeve, and then I saw he held a little wriggling red demon by the tail. The little creature bit and fought and tried to get at his hand, and in a moment he tossed it carelessly behind a counter. No doubt the thing was only an image of twisted India rubber, but for the moment and his gesture was exactly like that of a man who handles some petty biting bit of a vermin. I glanced at Gip, but Gip was looking at a magic rocking horse. I was glad he hadn't seen the thing. I say, I said in an undertone, and indicating Gip and the red demon with my eyes. You haven't many things like that about, do you? None of ours probably brought it with you, said the shopman, also in an undertone, and with a more dazzling smile than ever. It's astonishing what people will carry around with them unawares. And then to the Gip, do you see anything you fancy here? There were many things Gip fancied there. He turned to the astonished tradesman with a mingled confidence and, res and respect. Is that a magic sword? He said. A magic toy sword. It neither bends, breaks, nor cuts the finger. It renders the bearer invincible in battle against anyone under 18. Half a crown to seven and sixpence, according to size. 
These panoplies on cards are for juvenile knight errant and very useful. Shield of safety, sandals of swiftness, helmet of invisibility. Oh, daddy, gasped he Gip. I tried to find out what they cost, but the shopman did not heed me. He had got Gip now, he had got him away from my finger. He had embarked upon the exposition of all of his confounded stock, and nothing was going to stop him. Presently I saw with a qualm of distrust and something very like jealousy that Gip had hold of this person's finger, as usually he has hold of mine. No doubt the fellow was interesting, I thought, and had an interesting faked lot of stuff. Really good fake stuff, but still. I wandered after them, saying very little, but keeping an eye on this prestidigital fellow. After all, Kip was enjoying it, and no doubt when the time came to go, we should be able to go quite easily. It was a long, rambling place, that showroom, a gallery broken up by stands and stalls and pillars, with archways leading off to other departments in which the queerest-looking assistants loafed and stared at one another, and with perplexing mirrors and curtains. So perplexing indeed that these that I was presently unable to make out the door by which we had come. The shopman showed Gip magic trains that ran without steam or clockwork. Yet, as you set the signals and then some very, very valuable boxes of soldiers that all came alive directly if you took off the lid and said, I myself haven't a very quick ear and it was a tongue twisting sound, but, but Gip, he has his mother's ear. Uh, Gip got it in no time. Bravo, said the shopman, putting the men back into the box unceremoniously and handing it to Gip. Now, said the shopman, and in a moment Gip had made them all alive again. You'll take that box? asked the shopman. We'll take that box, said I, unless you charge its full value, in which case it would need a trust magnet. Dear heart, no, said the shopman, and he swept the little men back again, shut the lid, waved the box in the air, and there it was in brown paper, tied up and with Gip's full name and address on the paper. The shopman laughed at my amazement. This is genuine magic, he said, the real thing. It's a little too genuine for my taste, I said. After that, he fell to showing Gip tricks, odd tricks, and still odder the way they were done. He explained them, he turned them inside out, and there was the dear little chap nodding his busy bit of a head in the sagest manner. I did not attend as well as I might. Hey, presto, said the magic shopman, and then there would come the clear, small, hey, presto, of the boy. But I was distracted by other things. It was being borne in upon me just how tremendously rum this place was. It was, so to speak, inundated with a sense of rumness. There was something a little rum about the fixtures even about the ceiling, about the floor, about the casually distributed chairs. I had a queer feeling that whenever I wasn't looking at them straight, they went askew, and moved about and played a noiseless puss in the corner behind my back. And the cornice had a serpentine design with masks, masks altogether too expressive for proper plaster. Then, abruptly, my attention was caught by one of the odd-looking assistants. He was some way off and evidently unaware of my presence. I saw a sort of three-quarter length of him over a pile of toys and through an arch, and, you know, he was leaning against a pillar in an idle sort of way, doing the most horrid things with his features. The particular horrid thing he did to himself was his nose. He did it just as though he was idle and wanted to amuse himself. First of all, it was short and blobby, and then suddenly he shot it out like a telescope, and then out it flew and became thinner and thinner until it was like a long red flexible whip. Like a thing in a nightmare it was, he flourished it about and flung it forth as a fly fisher flings his line. My instant thought was that Gip mustn't see him. I turned around and there was Gip, quite preoccupied with the shopman and thinking no evil. They were whispering together and looking at me. Gip was standing on a little stool and the shopman was holding a sort of big drum in his hand. Hide and seek, Dada, cried Gip. You're he and before I could do anything to prevent it, the shopman had clapped the big drum over him. I saw what was up directly. Take that off, I cried, this instant, you'll frighten the boy, take it off! The shopman with the unequal ears did so without a word, and held the big cylinder towards me to show its emptiness. 
and the little stool was vacant. In that instant, my boy had utterly disappeared. You know, perhaps that sinister something that comes like a hand out of the unseen and grips your heart about? You know, it takes your common self away and leaves you tense and deliberate, neither slow nor hasty, neither angry nor afraid. So it was with me. I came up to the grinning shopman and kicked his stool aside. Stop this folly, I said. Where is my boy? You see, he said, still displaying the drum's interior. There is no deception. I put out my hand to grip him, and he eluded me by a dexterous movement. I snatched again, and he turned from me and pushed open a door to escape. Stop, I said, and he laughed and receded. I leapt after him into utter darkness. Thud. Lord bless my heart, I didn't see you coming, sir. I was in Regent Street, and I had collided with a decent-looking working man, and a yard away, perhaps, and looking a little perplexed with himself, was Gip. There was some sort of an apology, and then Gip had turned and come to me with a bright little smile, as though for a moment he had missed me, and he was carrying four parcels in his arm. He secured immediate possession of my finger. For the second, I was rather at a loss. I stared round to see the, shop of the, ma the door of the magic shop, and behold, it was not there. There was no door, no shop, nothing, only the common pilaster between the shop where they sell pictures and the window with the chicks. I did the only thing possible in that mental turmoil. I walked straight to the curbstone and held up my umbrella for a cab. Anthems, said Gip in a note of culminating exultation. I helped him in, recalled my address with an effort, and got in also. Something unusual proclaimed itself in my tailcoat pocket, and I felt and discovered a glass ball. With a petulant expression, I flung it into the street. Gip said nothing. For a space, neither of us spoke. Dada, said Gip at last, that was a proper magic shop. I came round with that to the problem of just how the whole thing had seemed to him. He looked completely undamaged so far. Good. He was neither scared nor unhinged. He was simply tremendously satisfied with the afternoon's entertainment, and there in his arms were the four parcels. Confound it, what could be in them? Uh, I said, uh, little boys can't go to shops like that every day. He received this with his usual stoicism, and for a moment I was sorry I was his father and not his mother, and so couldn't suddenly there quorum publico in our handsome kiss him. After all, I thought, the thing wasn't so very bad. But it was only when we opened the parcels that I really began to be reassured. Three of them contained boxes of soldiers, quite ordinary lead soldiers, but of so good a quality as to make Gip altogether forget that originally these parcels had been magic tricks of the only genuine sort. And the fourth contained a kitten, a little living white kitten, in excellent health and appetite and temper. I saw this unpacking in a sort of provisional relief. I hung about in the nursery for quite an unconscionable time. That happened about six months ago, and now I'm beginning to believe it is all right. The kitten had only the magic natural to all kittens, and the soldiers seem as steady a company as any colonel could desire. And Gip? The intelligent parent will understand that I have to go cautiously with Gip. But I went so far as this one day, I said, how would you like if your soldiers turned uh, to come alive, Gip, and march about by themselves? Mine do, said Gip. I just have to say the word, and I open the lid. Then they march about alone? Oh, quite, Dada. I shouldn't like them if they didn't do that. I displayed no unbecoming surprise, and since then I have taken occasion to drop in upon them once or twice, unannounced, when the soldiers were about but so far I've never discovered them performing in anything like a magical manner. It's so difficult to tell. There's also a question of finance. I have an incurable habit of paying bills. I have been up and down Regent Street several times looking for the shop. I am inclined to think, indeed, that in that matter, honor is satisfied, and that since Gip's name and address are known to them, I may very well leave it to these people, whoever they may be, to send in their bill in their own time.
Appointment by Olivia Parks. I'm sorry I'm late, I said, unwinding my scarf and piling my layers onto an empty swivel chair beside the stylist station. The crumpled clothes looked shabby in the gleaming, mirrored room, like something you'd find under a bridge. I was wearing pretty much everything I owned. This little jaunt was the first time I'd left the house in weeks, and let me tell you, you could die out there. A band of polar winds high up in the atmosphere held the city hostage, locked in a bitter freeze. I exhaled experimentally and was relieved to no longer see my breath. No, no, you're fine, the stylist said, glancing at the appointment book lying open on a stand beside her. The book was out of keeping with the airy environs, gilt-edged and leather-bound, like you'd find in some big man's library. I peered over and saw that the facing pages were densely filled with script. How old-fashioned. I wondered if the library book was the latest anachronism. When would the young stop rooting around in the past like a trunk for some necessary accessory? Even my boy Paul was not immune. He said some very nasty things to me when I sold his record player a few years ago. I said his big bushy mustache made him look like a Chicago cop. Take a seat, Moira offered, smiling. The stylist name appeared in my head like writing on a card. I slunk into the low chair and tried to look tough while she draped me in a smock. My eyes were rabbity red. Water? Tea? She asked. Champagne, I said wildly. I was pretty sure this was going to cost a fortune anyway, and I needed a drink. I hate haircuts. I have a mortal fear of them, in fact. But this Moira had been recommended to me as having divine powers. Indeed, she looked annoyingly like an angel. Her cropped hair dyed a futuristic blue-white that said, Forever Young. She was wearing a kind of plastic sheath dress with a lazy, flounce collar. Soon the drink sparkled in my hand and I relaxed. So, what are you thinking? Moira asked, serene behind my shoulder. Oh, just freshen it up, I said lamely. Uh, not, nothing too drastic. Moira ran a hand through my shoulder-length strands and frowned. The whole effect was staticky and gray, a cloud of bad weather I'd been standing in for years. I felt her tap the bald patch at the back and reddened. I'm, I'm ready for something new, I croaked, but, but, but not too new. Though I had laid waste to vast tracts of my life and once even set fire to the place I lived in with my son, it was as hard for me as for anyone to let go of what I had. I understand, Moira said. She spritzed my hair with something that smelled leafy and clean. I scanned the counter reflexively and wondered if there was anything to steal. We can talk through it. With new clients, I always like to begin with a consultation. I felt a rush of gratitude, or maybe it was nerves. I hadn't been to a salon in a long time, and never to a place like this. The mirrors made it hard to see where the room ended or began. Usually I just snipped at my hair with kitchen scissors above the tub whenever it started to feel like it was strangling me in my sleep. I never kept any of the appointments I made, but it was just nice to use the phone. And I'd had no intention of keeping this one, but the super had turned the heat off. When I woke up a few hours before, my breath had filled the basement apartment with cold little puffs that hung around like Christmas baubles. It was a nice effect, but spooky, and I was glad to have to bundle up and hurry out. Though the level in my glass looked undiminished, I could feel the celebration of champagne. It was like a lot of people knocking back drinks and smashing their glasses on the walls of my belly and brain. I wanted to party. I have a very important event tonight, I said, nodding while Moira brushed me out. An opening. People are coming from all over to see my paintings. You're an artist, Moira laughed, in a sound like silver bells hurrying over something special. Yes, I said, sipping the lovely fizz. A painter. I didn't feel bad. Though I don't have much experience with such things, I imagine that everyone lies to hairdressers and that the hairdressers are secretly glad. What was I going to tell her? That some weeks or months before I had lost my lousy job, which in truth I'd liked fine and might even once have been good at, uh, taking calls on the pesticide hotline. That I'd spent Christmas watching game shows on my neighbor's couch. People did not want to hear it. This verbatim from my own son, who had not spoken to me in years. I don't want to hear it, Ma, Polly said, 
although I had apologized and tried to explain. When you've been around, the world starts to look like a lot of people yelling their heads off with their hands clapped hard over their own ears. I probably wasn't listening either. I'd leaned in close to catch my husband Harold's last words, his very last on this earth, and they were, I swear, I won't say it again. What kind of paintings do you make? Moira asked, holding a color swatch against my cheek. I was grateful for the mirror. It was easier to speak to someone when I could see we were on the same plane. I met her eyes for the first time. I want to say they were white, but, but like light is, a combination of every color you could see. I smelled lilacs. I, uh, I paint people the way their dogs see them, said I. It felt almost true. Warmth expanded in my chest, and the room, already bright, grew brighter. In the mirrored walls, I fancied I could see large and luminous paintings, swimming slightly as if underwater. It's not true that dogs only see in black and white, I said, understanding something for the first time. The paintings were made up of mostly different shades of yellow and blue, and a whole spectrum of impossible grays, like you find in a pigeon's wing. Though those portraits were blurry, dogs tend to be nearsighted, or in some cases entirely featureless. The sitters were instantly recognizable as themselves. My boy Polly was there, and Harold, and poor Lynn, who sat beside me for years working the lines, until she drank Dazanon and died. Even that bastard super had his mug on the wall, a riot of strokes that conjured a smell. You couldn't say if any of them were beautiful or ugly. Personality lay loose about the person in sketchy folds, like drapery suggested by a master's hand. People look nothing like what they think, I said, and the breath I drew next was like a window opened to a stuffy room. Oh, I agree with you there, Moira said. If my clients could see what I saw, they'd save themselves a lifetime of grief. She laid both hands on my shoulder and smiled. Now, tell me, what do you want? I trembled. No one had asked me this for a long time. After a pause, I said, I, I want it to look completely natural, like nothing has been done, but, but something's occurred, something wonderful. I explained that I was afraid of change, but wanted desperately to be changed. I was out of control, but could not let go. I couldn't bear another inch of sudden loss. I wanted to look exactly like myself, but also like that Mexican actress in the detective show. Of course, my own hair was not curly or dark, I knew that. I wasn't blind, but I felt it shared some latent attitude, a kind of no-nonsense, kick-ass, come-and-get-me that could be brought out with a subtle layers or the right shampoo. I wanted something low-maintenance. Really, I just wanted to be able to tie it back when I went to the gym. I wanted to go to the gym, or at least go outside. I wanted out of that hellscape basement where I'd woken a few hours before my face frozen to a crust of vomit, the same shade as the luckless carpet. And I was sorry if she could smell it on my hair. I wanted to quit drinking and call Polly and have her meet me on a bench somewhere warm. I wanted my hair to form a strong, unbroken rope that I could use to swing from place to place, or escape from a tower or lift a man up through a window to my room at a great hotel. I wanted a compliment I could tolerate only the barest touch-up and trim. Do you have a photo? Moira asked. Sometimes it's helpful to have a picture. I rustled under the smock and unzipped my soiled fanny pack, then handed her a crumpled image. I'm sorry it's small, I said, wiping my nose. My head in the photo was no bigger than the thumbprint, tucked above Paul's tiny shoulder, my hands locked at his waist. I'm crouching while he stands on a green tongue of lawn, and the sun is going down behind us. Against the blaze, my hair glows like a struck match, a halo of flyaways catching the light. And what do you like about the picture? Moira asked carefully. What do you mean? I said, embarrassed, pulling it down into my lap. I find it's helpful to ask, she said, so that we're seeing the same thing. Sometimes people like the way a cut flatters a jawline, for example, and I have to explain that they have a totally different face shape. I looked down at the picture. 
It's her eyes, I said. They were speck-sized and hard to see, but I could feel them looking out. Yes, Moira said, and she sounded pleased. I think we can do that. She began to part my hair into sections with a comb, painting each piece with an acrid paste before tucking it briskly into a foil. She was methodical and absorbed. I was unbearably tired, so I closed my eyes. Harold had taken the picture right after he finished laying the lawn. I hadn't known that grass came like that, rolled up in living rugs, and was as astonished as five-year-old Paul to see the strips unfurled and padded into the topsoil one at a time. It was easy and hopeful, a new life. It had all been over so soon. The passing sun warmed a stretch of fresh grass, released a sweet green smell, and was gone. I should have paid more attention. I should have let Polly play on the unrooted turf that afternoon, tearing around at its hour of perfection. Don't fuck it up, I had said, to myself, or to him, or both. The angry way I said it was less a warning than a curse. I turned. It turned out it wasn't even our grass. Harold had stolen it from a big shipment at the garden center where he worked. Some of the guys came a few days later and hauled it away. I should have known then. A sick man will steal the strangest things. After Harold croaked, they took the house too. Polly and I moved to one shoddy place another. I came home late. I came home early in the morning and let him pour a whole box of sugar into our cereal and milk. He was a good boy. Was it so bad that I wanted to have a good time? Life grew like ash on a cigarette if you forgot to breathe, till with a shiver it fell. So what if I didn't put out the flames? I remember the acrylic bedspread in our temporary digs looked finally alive, dancing hot as merry hell. So I liked to drink. So I liked to heat what happiness I had and watch it burn. My ears were warming like something in a pain, in a pan. I opened one eye. Moira had set me under a lamp and was tucking my packaged hair into a loose-fitting plastic cap. There, she said, quite the artist. I opened the other eye, considering. The way the cap folded out and covered my ears, I did look a little like that Dutch guy. When I got out of here, I thought, maybe I really would get myself a box of paints. Lay out the colored tubes and start. I could make a mess and see later if it meant something. Moira disappeared to wash up. I dozed under the lamp, cozy as a nested egg. The room dimmed and brightened through my half-lidded eyes. Let's get you washed, Moira said. She led me to the bowl. I leaned back. The recessed edge of the basin held the crook of my neck like a hand. How's the water? she asked. Great, I answered. My scalp tingled under the warm rush. Her fingers were firm, familiar. They sought and found, and I didn't want it to stop. Does that feel good? she asked. Yes, I said, flexing my scalp into her hands. I was afraid to open my eyes. Her movements grew more urgent and almost violent. In the dark, I sensed another Moira, a winged and deadly creature hunting at night. My hand was a small animal caught in her jaws. A whole life ran under its skin. I was in the grip of the angel Azrael, awed by her command of beauty, as well as her ability to catch and cleanly kill. Back at the station, Moira took out the scissors. Wait, I said. Don't be frightened. She combed and measured, parting the wet strands. My hair hung in two straight curtains round my face. All this she said, lifting one side and letting it fall, is already dead, so why not let it go? Fat tears gathered in my eyes, and my vision quivered. The clean blades shone. With a shudder, I remembered the emptiness of my apartment. It had been so empty when I woke, and glowing with that chill, illuminated air. It was an old friend. Look at me, Moira said, and I did. A sound escaped and I stood it. Her hand at my shoulder held me steady. The scissors snipped, and I felt lighter. Then I felt nothing at all. Afterward, she handed me a round mirror so that I could examine the back. I turned the glass this way and that, admiring. When I held it at a certain angle, the facing mirrors showed the two of us in an infinite sequence of receding images. I could not stop smiling. I looked 
How do I put it? I looked like a person with a place to go. Please, I said, swiveling in my seat to clasp her hand. Please, come, come with me tonight. It wouldn't be a party without you. Though I had lied and been afraid and lost the thing I loved most, I felt certain that my true life, the next, would come easily after this. I'd be delighted, she said. Our heels clicked in unison along the pavement outside. It was still cold, but the brilliant, bearable kind that made the stars glitter in their velvet case. I didn't know exactly where I was going, but I was sure I would arrive. People were glad to be put out on the streets walking in pairs. There was a buzz as at the hour of crossing when people were going out and going home. We turned a corner and I saw the gallery across the street, lit up and marvelous like a pharmacy at 3 a.m. The big, bright window was full of people I knew, and many I didn't, all holding glasses of champagne. I lifted a hand to my head. I was ready. Oh, Moira squeezed my arm suddenly. Before we go in, can I take a photo? My followers love a before and after. Anything, I said. I leant obligingly against the brick of a corner store. It was hard to remember much without my hair, but the tug of the past made me frown. What about before? I asked. It struck me that I'd missed it. An opportunity, a necessary step, a demand. Maybe, I thought, it had happened when I wasn't paying attention. You don't need to worry about that anymore, Moira said. She was already holding up her phone. This is after. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. Uh, that's all we've got for today. Uh, once again, if you would like to join us next time, our next story time is going to be on August 20th. Uh, I'm going to be reading two stories for you then. I'll be reading August Heat by W.F. Harvey and Land of the Lost by Stuart Onan. Hope to see you then. Have a good day. Thank you.